use that and all these comments really as a segue to an, another agent, which again, mechanistically is very different, which is radium-223. So we know that radium-223 is an alpha-emitting radiopharmaceutical. Um, it basically got approved based up, uh, on the Alsimka trial. We know that in that trial, they showed a survival benefit. There was no reduction in PSA, that the patients that did better had, a, had a, clearly a survival benefit was if they received at least five or six doses. It's a one-minute injection. It's given four weeks apart. Uh, we know because of it's an alpha emitter, it has, seems to have less myelosuppression. It clearly is a bone targeting agent, and I think it's, it's, I think it's a really well-tolerated drug. It's got a really nice uh, safety profile. So my question is, and you know, we're going to talk a little bit more about this, but I really want to dovetail on what you were talking about because we, we started going down this road a little bit of molecular mechanisms. So this is a bone targeting agent, and in Alsemco, we, know, we knew that you could not have visceral disease. You could have limited nodal disease of less than, less than three centimeters, and you had to be relatively asymptomatic and were not being considered at the time for docetaxel chemotherapy. So, Alicia, in your practice, so if you've got a patient that you think has, let's just say, high volume metastatic disease is asymptomatic, do you give radium by itself? Do you, uh, do you, because it's not attacking the androgen access, do you, would you go ahead and start a concomitant Abby or Enza? I think there are situations where I would do both, um, which is a great non-answer to your question. But I would say, you know, if, if a patient has lymph node positive disease, I actually will probably use an AR-directed therapy with radium because I don't feel comfortable not treating that and controlling that part of disease. We know that metastatic disease can seed other metastatic sites, and so I want to control every place that I possibly can. Um, if that patient is completely asymptomatic but has high vo volume disease, often I can find a symptom even if they don't ha have one. So maybe they have low back pain, maybe they have this or that, but if radium is what I need to use next, and that's a, that's a, that's a decision, have I already used chemotherapy? Is the patient not interested in chemotherapy? Where am I in my treatment spectrum? I, I will find a symptom and I will, will treat it. And that symptom may be bone pain. That symptom may be fatigue. That symptom might be anemia, um, which we know can be related to infiltrative disease in the bone marrow, ALKFOS that's elevated. Um, I would say that most people who have bony disease have at least something. Um, that justifies that. And, and I believe in using radium not just because I think it relieves bone pain, because radium is associated with a survival benefit. A and that's, that's why I use radium. So I do want to get it into everyone I think can tolerate it. And where I work it into the spectrum is not necessarily after chemotherapy. Um, it, it may be before. It really just depends on how that patient's doing and, and where I am in terms of what is the best treatment for that patient. So you would feel, you, based upon what you just said, so if you had some element of soft tissue disease, you know, limited nodal disease, that would be the appropriate patient also to combine if you could get it covered by insurance. I, with, I, have, seems not to had, be a, I have not had trouble with that, right. actually. Right. Don't tell the people in Tennessee. Right. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I have not really had trouble with that. And, I, and like I said, I just don't feel comfortable having untreated disease. Uh, and I know that radium is not treating that soft tissue. Dan, what about you? What I would add to that is, again, I tend to also combined therapies or layer therapies, I tend to find uh, a way in these patients to document symptoms. But you, I, in my patient population, there's such high PSA anxiety and uh, treating with Zofigo alone, it, the, the conversations uh, for waiting six months and their PSA is going up. We've, we've done that with ProVenge, we've done that experiment. So again, whether I layer on a, an Abbey or an Enza to maybe help them control the PSA anxiety and also use another mechanism of action to treat their prostate cancer, I think is a big benefit to these patients. But Jorge, should we be worried? And so maybe I'm overthinking this because we, you know, we know that there is at a, at a, at a cellular level, at a molecular level, we know the Hopkins data that, that Emmanuel reported out is that you get this treatment pressure selection in patients who have been previously treated with, e, with either Abbey or Enza, that they will get these androgen receptor variants, whether it's V7 or you know whatever else is out there. Based upon your commentary, which you and I have had discussed before about 
that's the rationale for checking a PSA very early because if you don't see a drop in their PSA, you know immediately clinically without measuring it serologically that you probably have a variant that, that, that's not working. So if you have a patient like, like we're talking about, this asymptom this minimally symptomatic patient who's still, for the most part, pretty active and has predominantly bony metastatic disease, do we, should we be worrying about driving a mutation too early by the layering in of, of either an ABI or an enzyme? So, so it's a complex, loaded question. But right, let that's me, why uh, I asked you. <laughs> so, uh, so, so, for, so the, the standard of care for, uh, for men with metastatic castration resistant disease today is either ABI or ENSA or CIPT or radium 3 or docetaxel. What I have a disagreement with the NCCI guidelines is that, you know, they actually remember the impact trial, the Cougar 302 and Prevail, identical patient entry, right? It was basically patients with asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic disease, which meant no opioids, right? That's it. Yet the label for ABI and ENSA allows them to treat patients with symptomatic disease. Now, I fundamentally don't think, I, I, I don't have any issues with that, but I do have an issue when our guidelines state that docetaxel should be only used for patients with symptomatic disease, and I think it's incorrect because if you remember TAX 327, SWOC 9916, we did not mandate for people to have symptomatic disease. It was you have metastatic castration resistant disease, you get either mitosantrin or uh, uh, docetaxel, that's it. So I think that's sort of the battle that I have. If you remove CPT out of that equation for a little bit, then clearly in the United States, oral therapy or chemo, oral therapy would win. Chemotherapy or a radionucleotide, radionucleotide therapy will win. I don't think like that, right? And I agree with Alicia. It really depends when I see the patient. You know, if the patient comes after chemo, then my, I structure my treatment differently. Now, I don't think Sofig or, or radium 2 3 should be thought out as either or. I think it's part of the continuum of care. And in fact, if you look at the Alsimca best supportive data, it is what I use to be vocal about using ENSA or ABI, you pick your uh, oral agent, to support in combination therapy. Why? When we look at the best supportive care, we allow MSET, which is an all nitrogen muster. You know, we allow radiation therapy. We allow ketoconazole. Well, ABI is a better ketoconazole, more selective, less toxic, maybe more expensive. You know, they allow antiandrogen therapy. Well, they didn't mean, you know, enzalutamide. They meant probably bicalutamide, flutamide, or nilutamide but we have a better AR inhibitor, right? Less agonistic. So I use that data to say, listen, I feel very comfortable giving you dual therapy with RIAM223 and ABI. The biggest question in my practice is, when do I pull the trigger to start you? Do I start you ABI first or oral therapy first, or do I start RIAM223 first? My tendency right now is I start you in an oral therapy first, and it depends on your symptoms and how you're doing with your quote unquote bony disease, I make that decision to add on, or for that matter, if you're progressing on ABI or ENSA and you are not ready for chemotherapy or to switch to a treatment outside clinical trials and you're forced, we need to move on to another treatment and that treatment happens to be an oral agent, which is very uncommon in my practice, but sometimes you have to do it, then I will actually do oral therapy in combination with RIAM223. The earlier you do RIAM223, you have more likelihood to complete the six cycles. And remind you, the Alsimca, the median number of cycles given was six cycles. If you look at our data, you know, Oliver presented the data, we presented the data with him, you know, and the Michigan data, the median number of cycles given in the post-chemotherapy space is around three to four. Now, if you have someone with symptomatic disease, I think the biggest question is, do, could you afford as a patient to wait until you have pain relief? RIAM 2 to 3 doesn't control pain in a week. Systemic docetal uh, chemotherapy does within 48 to 72 hours if you treat the patient really well, right? So for me, it is not about sim it's not about waiting until you have a lot of symptoms. It's earlier because I think you can actually endure that therapy uh, uh, earlier. Lastly, if I may, a lot of people are concerned about using RIAM223 before chemotherapy because there's risk for myelosuppression. The risk of myelosuppression in pre or post docetaxel goes from chemo naive is around one percent, chemo treated is around three to four percent. I remind the audience that the risk of the, or the incidence of grade three neutropenia with docetaxel alone in any trial that you look is between six to 12%. So that shouldn't be a reason why one would be concerned about using RIAM223 in that context. And lastly, is the median survival difference between placebo and RIAM223 is not drastically 
great. So urologists may say, Jorge, a three month difference, that's nothing. But I remind you the hazard ratio that we have had since 1999, when Marosantro got approved for pain improvement, symptom improvement, has gone from almost 0.9 to almost 0.66 and Radium 23 is 0 0.69, so it's right along with what we have done and developed for the last five years. So I really believe it's an active agent. We do see PSA responses in around 16% of patients or so forth. The challenge is that I would never talk to my patients and tell them, I'm gonna put you on Radium 23, and you should expect to see a PSA decline. I tell them, I'm gonna put you on Radium 23 because I'm gonna make you, likely make you live longer, control your symptoms, delay your progression from SSEs, and by default, your PSA may go down, but do not expect to see your PSA down. And because I don't have any issues with waiting for PSA because most people are on oral therapy, the PSA issue goes away as we did with CPT right. when we combine CPT with AVI or ENSA. I agree, and I think that that discussion is strengthened by the fact that the overall survival improvement is, is the same as all the other agents. And so PSA is part of the story, but not necessarily all of the story. And I tell patients to think about the prostate cancer cells exploding, and they're releasing the PSA. And that's that's maybe why we're, we're seeing those levels rise. But I think with the right encouragement, you, you can absolutely absolutely do that. And and I, I also think that it's important to incorporate another mechanism of action in our armamentarium. And, not using one of our options is not is not the right thing to do. And, and nicely, as they look at subset analyses, it's just exactly to your point. The people who were had less or no opioid use actually did better. You know, the healthier patients that could go through the more cycles had higher hemoglobins on entry, et cetera, did did better. And to me, kind of thinking of it as a scientist, as you mentioned, you know, it's a it's a it is a sidle drug that that alpha particle is is so powerful, but it has a short distance of travel compared to beta emission, so it's not going to cause the myelosuppression. And I often conceptually worried, well, how much of this would be needed for this bone remodeling to be happening for it to be incorporated? Like, did you should you not give something like Avirenza because it may slow down that process and you need it, or would a rank ligand inhibitor be a you know be a bad choice in this? But it seems like that's not the case. The Abby and Enza work fine. It, even people on denosumab do better when they, with, with radium-223 even. And so that's all you know, very good. And then you know, finally, and we'll put this back to the, to the radonks, it seems that there's data coming that retreatment even is, is, fair, is fairly safe. Yes. Um, and so you don't right, have to think, pull trigger once. I think Oliver said, I mean, I think yeah. he had a, a series where I think that the time to the end of the first treatment, uh, the, the first completion of the first cycle to the retreatment was six months, I believe, yeah. and, and patients, you know, did really well still. So I think, right, I, you know, that's kind of the interesting thing about all these agents is, you know, whether it's radium-223, whether it's CIPT is, okay, we know what the first trial did, so what about retreatment, you know, especially with the immunotherapies?